Hello, this is Paul Long with Gisa Credit Union, and today we're going to show you how to fill out the personal financial statement, which is primarily used for most business lending here at the credit union. The very top section, you're going to put in today's date, the amount of credit that you requested, and the purpose of the loan. And then down here is the personal information part. You're going to put in your name, your date of birth, your address, years of the address. If you have a P.O. box or uh, any sort of other mailing address, you're going to put that there. If you've lived at this residence less than two years, we are going to need the previous two years, um, the, the previous address you had before the two years. And you put that information here and how long you live there. You'll put in your email address, home phone number, if you still have one of those, uh, cell phone number, and any other names which credit references, maybe a maiden name or uh, any other sort of name you may have. Put in your social security number, if you're a US citizen or not. Put in your driver's license information, which state, if you are married, separated, or unmarried, and if you own or rent your residence. You're gonna put in who your employer is, your, what your current position is and for how long you've been there, your business address, uh, the, I'm sorry, the address of your employer or business, your business phone number, and any sort of previous employer if it's also been less than two years. Now, this section is if you are married and you are going to be applying for a loan with the other individual, your spouse, you would either put, are you going to be applying this under your name alone or your name along with another person whose financial statement is attached, which is going to be here. Now, when you fill out a um, personal financial statement and you are married, you do need to put your spouse's information on here and list you and your spouse's information down below. If it's just you, then you do not need to put in this information um, under the spouse section. In this section here, um, it's also going to also ask you here, yes, if you're married and you'd like your spouse, your spouse as a borrower on this credit, or no. In this case, we're going to show it just as a husband and wife applying for joint credit together. And that was how I answered those questions. Now, the nice thing about this form is it will automatically do all of the math for you once you put in all your information. So this section here is that we're going to actually go to page two to do that. But we, before we go to page two, there is one more section you do need to fill out on this page. And that is going to be your annual income. So we're going to go ahead and put in whatever your salary is, your spouse's salary. If you earn any dividends or interest, bonus commissions, uh, if you receive any income from alimony, maintenance, or child support income, retirement, Social Security, or just other income that we may have missed there. All of that needs to be um, placed on here and it will do the math for you. If you currently rent and do not own any sort of real estate, you're going to put in your monthly rent payment here. And if you do have any sort of alimony or maintenance or child support, that does need to be listed here. So now we're going to get to the main core of the form, which is this section, which starts on two. Here at the very top under Schedule A is your cash, checking, savings, CDs, retirement section. If you added up all of the money that you have in your checking accounts, personally. Again, this is a personal financial statement. So we do not want you to put in any business information or business cash on this form. That's a separate. So in this case, I have $30,000 in cash in my in all my checking accounts that I have. I have 60,000 in all my savings and money market accounts that I have. I don't have any CDs, but if I did, I would put some in there. And here, how much do you actually have in retirement accounts? You may have multiple retirement accounts. Please go ahead and put those all together and put them in one number here. Non-retirement stocks and bonds. This is not where you're gonna put in any sort of IRA information, 401k, 403b, anything like that here. That's all gonna go under retirement assets. Here is if you actually have a small stock account that maybe you have, um, you know, you play around in the stock market a little bit, or maybe you own just some shares, in this case of Tesla, a thousand shares, price per unit gives you the market value under listed securities. Anything that's located on the NASDAQ or stock exchange is going to be considered listed securities. And there's also unlisted securities, which is here, which maybe you have private ownership in private companies is where you'd put that information here. So again, remember, retirement accounts are here, non-retirement 
are here. If you have more than three, you can also just put in here assorted and just put in the dollar amount of the fair market value and leave the section blank and that won't be a problem. Business equity. This was really important because under business equity, uh, in this case, Pulse Plumbing. Pulse Plumbing has a financial statement, has a balance sheet as of this date. A financial statement equity as uh, at the bottom is $50,000. I'm a 100% owner, so therefore I have 50,000 in equity. Now, let's say I also own, I mean, it's not Paul's building, um, but uh, Paul's Electric, okay? And Paul's Electric, I am actually only 25% owner, but we have 100,000 in equity. Well, in that case, my net equity amount would be, whoops, uh, would be 25,000. Schedule D is accounts, notes, and contracts receivable. So usually in this section, this is where people owe you money. Maybe you sold a house and you are acting as the bank um, and those people owe you money. That is where you're gonna put that information here. Most of the time this section uh, Schedule D is blank, but that is where you would do it. Schedule E is, goes over about your real estate. Okay, you have a primary home located at 123 Smith Road, you date acquired, how much it costs, its current market value. You can look up at Zillow or Redfin to find out just kind of a ballpark value. What is your monthly payment amount, including taxes and insurance, loan balance, and who's the mortgage loan holder? If you have a second mortgage or a home equity line of credit, please put that information here that's usually attached to your primary residence. In this case, too, there's also a commercial building that uh, this person has, and that's 567 Smith Road. It's a commercial building. Sorry, not loan. <laughs> um, and that was done um, on May um, of 2021. <laughs> You're catching my ears. Uh, cost is uh, 250000 is what was originally cost. The current market value is 400000 I'm earning $2,000 a month in monthly income. My monthly payment is $1,500. I have a loan balance of $250,000, and that's also with GISA. And if you notice that it automatically adds up all the information here. And you can put in any sort of rental properties or other buildings that you own. If you do need more space here, uh, there is actually a separate form that we can give you that will give you um, a little bit more lines if you have more um, than the required allotment here. Section F, life insurance. This is an important part that usually gets uh, missed. Life insurance, if you notice here, it's cash value life insurance is what we're looking for. Now, you may have a term life policy for a million dollars. You can put that on here, that's not a problem. But your cash value is probably zero. It's not a million dollars. The million dollars is your face amount. So that's where you would put that information here. If you do have any sort of life insurance with cash value, you would go ahead and put that cash value there. And here in this section, because you can borrow against that cash value at times, you can put in how much the loan amount is and um, who, what's the name of the insurance company. Schedule G talks over your personal property, vehicles, and other assets. In this case, we want to know what is the value, estimated value, of your vehicles. Let's say I own three cars, a boat, and an RV, and they're all worth $100,000. I would put that information here. If you have any other additional items you want to add in personal property or other assets that you find a value, you can go ahead and list those informations here. Next is Schedule H. This is your notes payable, which is your auto loans, your personal loans, student loans, anything like that. So say we have a, um, an auto loan for a Tesla. There's the collateral that is the Tesla. It's got the maturity date. Monthly payment is 600. Balance due is 50,000. I have a student loan. That's its maturity date, monthly payment, and balance due. And again, if you do have to have more than these line items, it is possible for you to just put on here, um, you know, five accounts and you can put in your, what the combined monthly payment or balance due is. Section I is revolving credit lines and credit cards. In this case, we have a GISA Credit Union credit card that has a $20,000 limit. It's got a $400 current balance and it currently has a $25 monthly payment. I also have a Bank of America card, which has got a $10,000 credit limit, and I don't know anything on it. 
Other installment application, uh, obligations. This would be another section if you have any other debt that's just not listed on there. There are some odd cases that go on there. There is a section here that says any personal taxes owing, including income tax. Um, in some cases, maybe you just haven't paid for this, this year's income tax, which is okay. You got to put that information on there on how much that balance is. And there's probably not a monthly payment because you're going to pay it before the time it's due. If you do owe back taxes, that information does need to be placed here. Schedule K goes over contingent liabilities. That is, are you a guarantor or co-signer on any business or personal loan? So in this case, Paul's Plumbing also has a line of credit with GISA that has that uh, Paul signed on as a personal guarantee. So we're going to list that information there because Paul put his personal guarantee on it, therefore it is a contingent liability. Another situation on here is maybe you have a child where you co-signed on a student loan. You would put that information here as well. You would answer these general questions if uh, any assets have been pledged that are shown below. Are uh, you a defendant in a lawsuit? Have you ever filed bankruptcy protection? If so, explain that. Do you have a trust? Explain what the name of that is. Have you ever borrowed from GISA Credit Union before? Yes or no? And make sure you read and understand here that we will um, obtain a credit report and make sure to sign. Now note that spouses do not need to sign unless he or she is a co-borrower or guarantor. Hopefully that helps you fill out uh, the personal financial statement. Go ahead and fill this out, sign it, and give it to your GISA Credit Union banker. Thanks for watching.